who Rockwell suggested that I talk on the Library of Liberty and Archive of Eagle, it put me in two minds. On the one hand, I was very glad to have a chance to talk about books, but on the other hand, from the part of the topic archive of evil, I had the impression that he wanted me to say something bad about certain books, and that is a role I find entirely an unaccustomed one, so I was very reluctant to do that. Uh, I'd like to begin by contrasting two books, or rather a theme found in both these books. Uh, the first of these is an excellent book that Lou mentioned in his talk last night, that is the uh, Murray Rothbard's 1982 study, The Ethics of Liberty. And the other book is the most influential modern book in political philosophy, John Rawls' The Theory of Justice, which came out in 1971. Uh, Murray Rothbard develops uh, his libertarian political thought in Ethics of Liberty from a very simple principle, that of self-ownership. Now, the self-ownership principle holds that each person is the owner of his or her own body and has the right to do certain things with, with that body that other people do not have. Other people do not have the right, the same rights over his body. A simple example, I think, will show the plausibility of this principle. Supposing that someone uh, needs a kidney transplant and decides that since you have two healthy kidneys, you should give him one of your kidneys. You don't care to do that. Now, supposing the person were to argue, well, look, even though you'll be worse off having one of your kidneys removed, uh, even though you'll be worse off having one of your kidneys removed, after all, you'll still be able to live out a reasonably normal life. Whereas if he had, this person who needs the kidney may well die very short, very soon if he doesn't get the kidney from you. I think most of us would conclude that this isn't sufficient justification for taking away your kidney. It's your body. You don't have to give the kidney to anyone if you, if you don't want to. Uh, now, so far, at least, uh, for most people, this is fairly non-controversial. There is a British political philosopher, uh, John Harris, who argued it, that there should be a lottery of body parts, and that people should be required to give up parts of their body where they would do the most good. But somehow, this idea hasn't caught on. <laughs> but uh, one thing, one uh, fact about human beings is very obvious is that people differ very much in their abilities and their uh, talents. And if we say that each person has control of his or her own body, then it would seem to follow that people uh, may benefit very diff to very different extents from the various abilities they have. And uh, Rothbard, uh, of course, finds nothing amiss with this, and in fact thinks this is the basis of a uh, free society. I should mention that uh, Hans Hoppe, who's one of our speakers, has developed Rothbard's ideas further in his work, and he has a very interesting argument based on the work of his, in part on the work of his teacher, Jürgen Habermas, that he developed a, what he calls the a priori of, communi of communication argument for rights, but I, I won't go into that now. I just say this is, a, I think, a very interesting supplement to uh, development of Rothbard's work. But now, what does Rawls say about this seemingly obvious idea that each person has the right to control his or her own body? Well, he says, no, this is not right. Ideally, everyone should be have equal assets and abilities. Everyone, it, it's wrong that some people benefit or have better lives than others. But in practice, we can't make everyone absolutely equal. So what we should do is have allow inequalities, but have these inequalities only so that they're to the advantage of the worst off group in society. So that you, you, it's all right if some people earn a good deal more than others, let's say, as long as that's to the advantage of the worst off group. Otherwise, it isn't. Now, 
how does Rawls reply to the very obvious uh, objection that, well, why should you not be able to control, your, to have control over your own abilities? After all, they are your abilities, aren't, aren't they? Why should you have to, uh, say, someone of superior ability have to surrender part of his income so that others with less talented can benefit? This seems at least prima facie unfair. Well, Rawls's argument basically is that it's people don't deserve their abilities. It's a matter of luck based on their heredity or environment, how they've been brought up, what how what talents they have, so that in his view, people really don't deserve to, to benefit from the talents they have. So in effect, what he has is really a justification for a, a system of state slavery. So on the one hand, we have the view of Rothbard that each person is the self-owner, then there's the Rawlsian view is that society is really the owner of everyone's assets and really should be, we should distribute these assets equally as far as possible, allowing inequalities only to the benefit of the worst off. Now, the Rawls' idea might strike you, I think, uh, should strike you as an absurd one, but I hope it won't surprise you to learn that of the two books, uh, Rothbard's book is hardly known among conventional political philosophers, whereas Rawls's book has been the source of hundreds, if not thousands, of books and articles. It's by far the most influential book of its kind. And when uh, one critic of, uh, of, of Rawls, the political uh, philosopher Robert Nozick, advanced some fairly obvious criticisms of Rawls's principle in his 1974 book, which is one very much worth reading, uh, Anarchy State Utopia. Uh, Nozick said, well, look, if we say that uh, the state is redistributing, should redistribute assets in the way we all want, aren't we in effect justifying slave labor? We're saying that people of superior ability should have to work for those of inferior ability. One of the replies to uh, Nozick by a follower of Rawls, uh, also a Harvard political philosopher, Thomas Gammon, but no, no, Rawls is not justifying slave labor because he's not saying people have to work for uh, other, for the poor or for others. He's only saying that if they want to benefit at all from their abilities, then they have to work for others. And I should say this is regarded by most political philosophers as a convincing reputation of no uh, Now, if you disagree that this is a uh, convincing reputation, and if you favor the sort of system Rothbard described, I think we have to ask ourselves, how did we arrive at so very different a system, a statist system that we have today? And here, I think the principal, what I would consider principal factor in accounting for this has been already discussed by John Denson in his talk this morning, that the the role of the state in is the state has grown through in constantly engaging in wars and and having defense buildups. This has been probably the single most uh, important element in, in accounting for the rise of the, of the state to virtually total power. And I'd like to recommend in this connection uh, the book edited by John Denton called Costs of War. In, in supplementing this, there's a very good collection of essays by the uh, famous uh, American journalist and writer on public affairs, John T. Flynn, which came out last year under the title Forgotten Lessons. Uh, some of Flynn's other books are also uh, perhaps a bit harder to get that are very good, such as his book As We Go Marching and his biography of Franklin Roosevelt, actually two biographies. Franklin Roosevelt, the Spoos County. Uh, all right, now what, what the basic point Flynn made was that the state, in because of wrong economic policies, is often faced with the possibility of depression or recession. So it seeks a quick fix to get out of this by spending vast sums of money. And one way in which it can to use it to justify this vast spending of money is to, uh, to, to get 
there to promote war scares. And so he saw that the, he described in very great detail how the state proceeds to uh, grow through these war scares. This, as uh, John Denton also mentioned, has been an Achilles heel of much of American conservatism. That's to say, many conservatives will tell you, oh, of course, we favor a very limited state, we believe in free enterprise, but of course, we have to have a very large defense budget. And it doesn't really make any difference, or very much difference, whether we call it, say, you know, we have spending, government spending for defense or welfare or education, it's still government spending, and it leads to the total state. And I should say, in understanding this process of how the state, uh, uh, state promotes wars to uh, achieve more and more centralization, I think it's very important uh, to look at particular case studies. It's not, it, we shouldn't just be satisfied with having some general theory of how this process works, but we need to examine particular cases, as, uh, as John Denson did in his account of Pearl Harbor. I mean, as the French historian Jules Michelet in the 19th century said, history is a resurrection of the flesh. And we need to look at particular examples of how the government has, uh, has promoted war. I'd like to mention, say, in this connection, just a few books. Uh, there are two very good studies by the great uh, American historian Charles Austin Beard. One was called the American Foreign Policy in the Making, and uh, the next one was, uh, which came out, uh, I think, a couple of years later in 1948, was called uh, President Roosevelt and the Coming of the War, uh, the Coming of the War in 1941. And what Beard showed with very convincing documentation was that. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had been elected on a program of non-intervention into foreign affairs, but that he gradually, throughout the 30s, uh, shifted his position in completely against his public statements. He continued to make public statements strongly favoring non-intervention. But then somewhere around, say, if you look at his Chicago Bridge, famous Chicago Bridge speech of October 1937, he suddenly shifted and then followed the much more warlike policy. So I think this is uh, gives a very good account of one particular case. And then also I would think it's uh, another example of how you can, uh, very valuable to look at is the origins of World War I. Here, I think much of the recent literature, uh, such as the Fritz Fischer's book, Germany's Grasp for World Power, isn't as good as the earlier literature. That the uh, too much of the recent literature has tended to demonize one country, namely Germany, and hold them entirely responsible for World War One. Whereas the earlier revisionist literature it has much more, I think, a much more nuanced account of the origins of war. And I think one book people should uh, certainly have a look at if you're interested in getting in, in, in this subject is. Sydney Fay's great book, uh, The Origins of the World War. Uh, I think it's possible you could get the 1930 edition rather than the 1928 one because he made some changes in his uh, conclusions in the second edition. But we now have, uh, I've uh, explained somewhat the basic difference between a libertarian statist philosophy and giving a example of what's a force opposed to that, namely the growth of war, but we now have to say, well, given that war is seen, at least on the self-evidently bad, how is it that people have fallen for this? How is it that we've gotten involved in so many wars? Why is it the government has succeeded in its aims of centralizing power, increasing power through promotion of wars? Uh, and here, I think we have we have to accord uh, primary at least, uh, important significance to the intellectuals. There have been particular writers who, uh, through their uh, often very astute propaganda, have been able to confuse the public and uh, advance the aims of the, of the state toward total power. Uh, I'd like to mention a, a, few, a couple books in which you. Uh, the process very well described. 
uh, there were two books I think that came out in the same year. One is uh, 1944. One is extremely well known, uh, Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom. But uh, the other book is perhaps even better than Hayek's great work, but has attracted less attention. It's uh, Ludwig von Mises' Omnipotent Government. Uh, both of Mises emphasized in Omnipotent Government that statist, intellects, in statist intellectuals uh, supported measures of economic, inter uh, of in in economic intervention into the, co into the economy in order to strengthen the power of the central government. And they deliberately rejected any notion of economic law as, uh, as, as, li as wrongly attempting to limit the power of the state. And he shows in, in this book in very elaborate detail, particularly in the case of German policy in the 30s, that uh, this uh, policy of statist intervention in the economy went hand in glove with pr the promotion of war and aggressive nationalism. And this is, uh, I think, one of the best accounts uh, of the rise of national socialism that is available. Hayek in Road to Serfdom had a very similar analysis to Mises, although he perhaps stressed the connection between the in, between the intellectuals and the developments in the economy to a lesser extent than the Mises. He tended to stress that if uh, people had wanted to have a certain plan for society, then given the diversity of people's values, this plan could only be enforced through coercion, since people have very different ideas of what's good and what's the best policy. A comprehensive the total plan will require uh, it's in incompatible with uh, freedom. And he traced also, giving principal attention to the German example, how this process de developed from uh, especially uh, taking account of world propaganda, certain writers in World War I, such as uh, various German writers, such as Werner Sohnbart and others, and showing that their ideas were later carried out in much more detail by the National Socialists. Now, in considering uh, these intellectuals, I think what I'd like to do now is focus on one intellectual in particular, one of these status intellectuals. And, uh, this writer is discussed to uh, some extent in, uh, to some extent in an essay in uh, the book edited by Cost of War that I mentioned before. This is in Murray Rothbard's outstanding essay, War is Fulfillment, Power in the Intellectuals. And he discusses it, uh, in the, the role of a man I'm sure you've heard of, the American philosopher John Dewey. Uh, Dewey, I think you'll know, uh, probably you've all heard of as the, one of the founders of progressive education, but he was much more than that. And I, uh, I'd like to offer some, uh, I'd recommend highly what uh, Rothbard says about Dewey in, 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 in the test, but I'd like to offer a few supplementary comments so that we can get some understanding of how the status intellectual work. Now, during World War I, uh, Dewey was a prime exemplar of one of the main failings of intellectuals during wartime. That's basically what he tried to do was rather than calm the passions of war, he tried to whip up hatred against the enemy by coming up with a pseudo-intellectual justification for a warlike policy. During the war, he issued a book called German Philosophy and Politics, which strongly denounced German thought in the, in the grip of Prussian autocracy and, as, and, and having as it one of at least one of the principal goals, the promotion of German world domination. Uh, Dewey's work was quite influential during the war, but uh, as you may know, Dewey lived a very long life. He was born in 1859, I think died somewhere around 1952 or 53, and as uh, it seemed likely that America would enter World War II, he decided that uh, it would be a good idea to reissue this book, which he did uh, with a new, uh, I think with a new afterward. It wasn't enough for him that he uh, helped get 
uh, one more started body black to put in his his uh, contribution towards doing it again. If it worked the first time, why not again? Uh, I think if, if we look at uh, the book, uh, Dewey's book, I think we can see a deeper underlying motivation than simply hatred of the enemy for his activity. Uh, what Dewey criticized, the principal thing he criticized in German thought was the thought that the Ger German philosophers, particularly Kant, thought of freedom only as an inner process. He thought that, according to Dewey, Kant thought that later German thinkers thought that freedom existed only in the mind and that the individuals had to be subject to the state in their, their actual, in their actions. So if you might have your individual conscience would be free, but you would be totally subject to the government authority in what you have to do. Now, this notion Dewey opposed because this had, would give a very limited role for intellectuals such as himself if it's the, the intellectuals are confined to this very limited mental sphere, then everything else is in the hands of the government. And he wanted, he thought intellectuals should play a much greater role in this. The intellectuals should re be really running things. I, I think uh, to what uh, doing like many people in the modern university are not satisfied with uh, just being by themselves, being in uh, isolated position. They want to exercise the, the, the authority in the public sphere because they think they're superior to other people. I think sometimes in thinking about modern university, I think of Browning's line on that uh, sad, obscure, sequestered place, which describes the university. Of course, Browning, when he wrote that line, was talking about purgatory, but it <laughs> applies to university. Uh, well, now, Dewey, I think, uh, and so I say, Dewey, we look at his, this book even further when he says the intellectuals should, should not, as the Germans want to be confined to some inner sphere, but should exercise power. There's an even deeper layer to Dewey's thought, and this is that he repudiated the notion of objective truth altogether. According to Dewey, if we think of truth as something out there in the world, as it were, if we say, for example, uh, what should the, how, what are the principles of economics, or who really caused the First World War, this is a false approach to knowledge. It's implying that the thinker is contemplating the world as somewhat apart from the world. Again, you remember similar to his criticism of the Germans for dividing thought between the inner and outer, inner thought and outer action, saying we have to take, we shouldn't take thought as apart from the world. We should be, this is what he thought, he said this was a, in his book Quest for Certainty, he said this was an aristocratic notion that the ancient Greeks had developed because they disdained physical labor. If we had, if we really emphasized the uh, physical labor more and didn't have this aristocratic attitude, then we'd see the important thing is our actions on the world, not just our contemplation. Of course, I'm sure you recognize the similarity here to Marx's thought. That remember that Marx said in the famous 11th thesis on Ludwig Farbach that uh, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world at the point, however, is changing. It's exactly the same phenomenon in, in uh, Dewey, that uh, the philosopher's role, the thinker's role, is to act on the world, to change it, rather than just to study, to study it. And, uh, this uh, notion, I should say, uh, the parallel between Dewey and Marx was drawn explicitly by a self-described uh, lifelong Menshevik, uh, Sidney Hook, who was both a follower of Dewey and a Marxist. Though so he thought he, he said this is, I mean, he, he thought that Marx and Dewey really supplemented each other entirely. And this has been a very influential uh, uh, strain of American radicalism. So the last book. Uh, 
I want to mention actually extends Dewey's notion even further. This is also one I put in my archive of evil. I guess I didn't find it so hard to talk about bad books after all. This is the very influential book that came out, I believe, in 1979 by Richard Rorty called Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature. Now, Rorty rates John Dewey one of the three greatest philosophers of the 20th century along with Ludwig Wittgenstein and Martin Heidegger. And what he, Rorty, says is that truth, at least in the social sphere, should not be taken as something that's out there at all. Rather, the important thing is what a particular community holds to be the case. So as Milton said, there's nothing either true or false, but thinking makes it so. It's something that the community decides what's true or false. It's not, it's not any, they're not limited at all by individual, by any requirements of, say, economic law or anything else. And I can, I think we can see this notion, which is really pragmatism, the Deweyite pragmatism carried to its ultimate extreme, fits in very well with statism because in the face of fairly obvious objections to the statist program, it simply disregards these and says there's no such thing as truth at all. Now, if you, I think it's one of the great achievements of Mises and Murray Rothbard and those who tried to follow in their footsteps, that they have rejected these notions that have stood up for both economic law and objective truth. And we can see in their, in the lives of Mises and Rothbard that in Robert Frost's phrase, this has made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you.